Hello and welcome to the Anglican Church, uh, St. John the Baptist Dixie in Mississauga, Ontario. I'm Father Daniel Brereton, and thank you for joining us for this 22nd Sunday in the season of Pentecost. A, re- a reminder, <laughs> Chester, you can say hello. Come here. Stop pulling. Ah, okay, say hello. No, say hello to them. Hi, welcome to St. John's, okay? There, you've been on. Now you can go. Go. A reminder that you can find an order of service containing the full text of today's liturgy at our website, or you can engage the closed captioning icon on your video screen and simply bring the text up as you're worshiping with us. I want to take this opportunity to wish uh, two of our parishioners, Brian and Elizabeth McCormack, a very happy 50th wedding anniversary. They celebrated that uh, a week ago, but this is our first opportunity to send our love and our best wishes from St. John's. Um, you will have seen their names on the flower commemoration just before this greeting. And uh, you'll see Elizabeth as uh, giving the first reading in today's service, and then Brian and Elizabeth will be together giving the peace later on. Uh, despite how reserved they may seem in the video, I can assure you, Brian and Elizabeth both have big, bright smiles and are lovely people, and we are very grateful for their presence here with us uh, in, at St. John's. And we thank you for your presence with us here today. Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Almighty God, to To you you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. O Jesus Christ, teacher and healer, you heard the cry of the blind beggar when others would have silenced him. Teach us to be attentive to the voices others ignore, and by the power of the Spirit, respond in your name to heal the afflicted and welcome the abandoned, for your sake and for the sake of the gospel. Amen. A reading from the book of Job. Then Job answered the Lord, I know that you can do all things, and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore I have uttered what I did not understand, 
things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Hear, and I will speak. I will question you, and you declare to me. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. And the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he had prayed for his friends. And the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Then there came to him all his brothers and sisters and all who had known him before. And they ate bread with him in his house. They showed him sympathy and comforted him for all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him. And each of them gave him a piece of money and a gold ring. The Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginnings. And he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, a thousand yoke of oxen, and a thousand donkeys. He also had seven sons and three daughters. He named the first Jemima, the second Keziah, and the third Karen Habuch. In all the land there were no women so beautiful as Job's daughters, and their father gave them an inheritance along with their brothers. After this, Job lived 140 years and saw his children and his children's children four generations. And Job died old and full of days. The word of the Lord. Psalm 34, verses 1 to 8. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall ever be in my mouth. Proclaim with me the greatness of the Lord. Let us exalt his name together. Look upon him and be radiant, and let not your faces be ashamed. The angel of the Lord encompasses those who fear him, and he will deliver them. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. They came to Jericho. As he and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many sternly ordered him to be quiet, but he cried out even louder, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, Call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he is calling you. So, throwing off his cloak, he sprung up and came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, My teacher, let me see again. Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and followed him on the way. The Gospel of Christ. May the Holy Spirit open our eyes that we might see Jesus, open our ears that we might hear Jesus, and guide me that I may speak of Jesus. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. In today's Gospel reading, we meet Bartimaeus, one of the great figures of faith in Mark's Gospel account. A man who sees Jesus clearly for who he is, and whose insight into who Jesus is leads him to become a follower. It's ironic, therefore, that 
arguably the one with the most clear vision of Jesus in all of Mark's gospel account, is a blind man. Now, in the very last verse of this passage, Jesus tells us what the key factor in Bartimaeus' healing is. Your faith has made you well. So what can we glean about faith, about strong faith, from this story of the healing of a blind beggar? Well, a great deal, I think. Perhaps the first thing we can say about Bartimaeus' great faith is that it is an active faith. Active and not passive. The story of Bartimaeus takes place in the 10th chapter of Mark. And two chapters before this, we are told of another story in which another blind man is brought to Jesus by his friends. After putting a paste of saliva and mud on the man's eyes, Jesus has to repeat the action because the man still can only partially see after this first attempt to heal him. And while it's tempting to think that maybe Jesus hasn't quite yet mastered the art of healing the blind, I think this story is in Mark's account because it reminds us that gaining sight, physical or maybe even more so spiritual, is never uh, something that happens right away. It's a progressive process. We don't always see clearly right away, just as the disciples who have spent all this time with Jesus still don't clearly see who he is or what his mission is all about. So the question for us then is, do we also give up on our faith? Do we give up on Jesus when we don't see everything clearly either? When things don't make sense, when we don't see the road laid out ahead of us and we're not exactly sure where we're going, do we give up or do we trust more that he will work within us and with us until we can see what it is he's asking us to see? This first blind man is presented as quite passive. It's his friends who bring him to Jesus and never once does he ask for anything himself directly. It's his friends who tell Jesus what it is he needs. I think sometimes our faith can be similarly passive. We depend on others to pray for us. And I don't mean we ask people to pray for us, that's always a good thing, but we expect others to do the praying for us. We expect others to read the word and interpret the scripture for us. We uh, depend on others to invite and encourage and maybe even nag us to attend church and worship. Now, we all need the support and encouragement of other Christians. It's why being part of a church community is important. Following Jesus was never meant to be a solitary exercise. But we also need to take personal responsibility for our faith, for our relationship with Jesus. We have to engage directly with Jesus ourselves through the word and through prayer. We must be active in worshiping as participants, not just as passive audiences sitting in a pew or watching online. We're not meant to just stay on the side of the road watching, or as Bartimaeus was doing, listening as Jesus and his crowd passes by. We're meant to be on the road with him. And Bartimaeus is not uh, content to just sit on the side of the road listening. He cries out to Jesus himself, even when the crowd tries to shut him up. He persists in being heard, in using his voice. He refuses to accept that as a blind beggar, he is, as the crowd obviously sees him, as unworthy and undeserving of Jesus' attention and help. He is ready to ask Jesus directly for what he needs. And he does so because he sees Jesus for who he is. Faith is active and it's persistent, even in the face of obstacles and objection. Bartimaeus sees Jesus for who he is. He calls Jesus son of David, a title which alludes to Jesus' descent from the royal house of David Although since the line was traced to the father, Jesus' blood connection to David could be questioned, and it was, 
But more importantly, Bartimaeus knows that son of David is a title for the Messiah, God's anointed one who is expected to come as righteous king and high priest. So far, Jesus has only been identified as Messiah twice, once by a demon who is terrified of Jesus's power to destroy him, and once by Peter, who Jesus then calls Satan for rejecting the idea that his Messiah, Peter's Messiah, should be anything other than a triumphant earthly king. Peter's Messiah is not allowed to suffer or die. Bartimaeus, however, links Jesus as Messiah with mercy. Son of David, have mercy on me. I think that's another aspect of faith. Faith is active, it is persistent, and faith grasps the true character of the one to whom, in whom we are placing our trust. While both the demon and Peter recognized Jesus' power, one feared it and one wanted it used as he thought best, neither of them could see that forgiving, healing, and restorative compassion served as the foundation of Jesus' power. But Bartimaeus saw that. Even before his eyes could see, Bartimaeus' faith could clearly see that Jesus was there to have mercy and to heal. Jesus even extends this mercy to the crowd. The very people who have been trying to silence Bartimaeus are now asked by Jesus to call Bartimaeus to him. I think it's interesting. Usually Jesus just goes directly to the person in need and, and says, what do you want me to do for you? But in this case, Jesus takes, uses the crowd, the very ones trying to silence Bartimaeus, and says, you call him to me. He invites them to be part of this healing. How subtle, and yet how profound is the healing of Jesus. By calling the crowd to this act of service, he opens their eyes to see Bartimaeus in a different light. I don't see him as unworthy, Jesus is saying, He's not beneath my notice. Why should he be beneath yours? Take heart, the people tell Bartimaeus. He is calling you. Without realizing that Jesus has already called them and changed their hearts. Interestingly, Jesus asks Bartimaeus the exact same question that he asked last Sunday when his disciples James and John request that Jesus grant them whatever they ask for. What do you want me to do for you, is the question Jesus asks. But while the disciples, James and John, asked for positions of glory, Bartimaeus asks simply to see. James and John want something that will elevate them above the others. The blessing that they seek for themselves is for themselves alone. But Bartimaeus wants only what others already have the ability to see, a gift which he will then use to become a follower. His blessing will enable him to better bless and serve others. So faith is active, it's personal, it's not passive and through others. Faith is persistent in the face of obstacles and faith sees the true character of God, which is love and mercy. And faith asks for things in accordance with God's character. Accepting God's answer because if God is loving, then what God chooses will be best. And it doesn't try to tell God how to respond, as Peter and James and John all did. Faith believes that God will answer, that there will be something that comes out of this request. One small detail in the story that is often missed is Bartimaeus throws off his cloak before going to Jesus. And as a beggar, the cloak would have been one of Bartimaeus' only possessions. It not only kept him warm at night, but it provided a place for him to sit and beg from. It was his one security. Again and again, Jesus had called those who were to follow him to leave their former lives behind 
to not cling to material possessions for their identity and their security. And we get that one story in Mark where the the rich young man comes to Jesus having uh, fulfilled all of the commandments and says, what is left for me to do? And Jesus says, only one thing. If you're to be perfect, take all that you have and go and sell it and give the money to the poor. And that is just too much for him to be able to do. And he walks away sadly. But Bartimaeus, who has only this one possession, and yet how important it is to him, he casts it off entirely because he knows that he's going to Jesus and that whatever Jesus will do, Bartimaeus has faith that something will happen, something will transform and change him. Whatever happens once he places himself in Jesus' hands, Bartimaeus knows that life cannot continue as before. He will be changed. That's faith. Knowing that there will be an answer, that something will happen. It may not be what we ask for. It may not be something we expect. But if we approach God in faith, God will respond. And it will change us. Job's story has been told through our first reading through over the last couple of weeks. Embittered by his own suffering, which he is convinced is an unjust punishment from God, Job begins accusing God of injustice. God responds, and we've heard part of this last Sunday, with his famous, where were you when I created everything speech, in which he reminds Job that God alone made the universe. God alone commands the forces of nature. And we often think that God's purpose in delivering this speech is simply to remind Job of how powerful he is, and therefore God doesn't have to answer to Job. But if that's all God is doing, that kind of makes God into a bit of a bully. And my faith, my faith which tells me that mercy and compassion are the essential characteristics of God, refuses to believe that God is just a bully. So I wonder if what God is saying to Job is more like this. I know this is a dark and difficult time for you, Job. But I want you to see the bigger picture here. In a world where there is ugliness, there is still much beauty and majesty and wonder. In a world where Satan sometimes has his way, and it is Satan who has caused this suffering, I the Lord, still have the final word. But you've become so consumed by fear of darkness that everything, including me, appears dark to you. It's only when Job truly sees God's true character, not only God's power, but the faithfulness and care evident in creation, that his vision expands beyond his own immediate suffering to see God's mercy at work in the world and in him, and he is healed. Now my eyes see you. Therefore I repent, Job says. And the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he had prayed for his friends. And the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Friends, let us take heart. For he has also surely called us or we would not be here. Let us also have the faith of Job, the faith of Bartimaeus, faith that persists despite the pain that surrounds us, faith that cries out with trust to the one we know to be above all things merciful, faith that doesn't cling to what was before, what came before, what we had before, but knows once we give ourselves to Jesus, even our greatest darkness can be, will be, transformed by his light. Amen.
systems of our society which impede liberty and justice. Let us pray. Son of David, have mercy on us. 
Open our eyes to the suffering and the sick. Help us reach out in compassion, as Jesus did, to heal with love. Now, aloud or in silence, we lift up in prayer those we know who are suffering. Let us pray. pray for the dying, those who mourn, and those whose eyes have closed to this life. May they open their eyes to behold the face of their Savior. Let us pray. Son of David, have mercy on us. As our Savior taught us, let us pray. Our Father Peace of the Lord be always with you. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen. Lord, who gave vision where there was only darkness, open your eyes to see the power of God at work in this world, that in the midst of fears of every kind, our sight might remain focused on him who has the power to restore what is broken and raise up what is fallen. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon each of you this day and always. Amen. Amen.
Take heart and go forth to follow him, for he is calling you. Alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia.